Today on Dr. G Engaging Minds. Many artists believe that sobriety will stifle their creativity. That success can only really happen through substance abuse or even depression or mental illness. As I got older, I realized that I think there is a connection between bipolar or depression and um, creativity, but I don't think, I'm going to say this very clearly, I don't think you need to stay depressed to stay creative. I just think in your mind, maybe it's slightly entangled. Jane Weedlin of the Go-Go's shares her journey to good mental health after becoming sober and embracing her diagnosis of bipolar disease. It's been three years now since that, and it's just, the weight off me is so immense, and I feel this lightness that I have never had. Jane also talks about her rise to fame at a young age and has some great advice for aspiring women artists. Hey, I'm Dr. G, and I'm here with singer-songwriter Jane Weedman. If you're a product of the 80s, like myself, you'll definitely know Jane as a founding member of the most successful female band of all time, the Go-Go's. She's also had a great solo career in music and movies. Hey, Jane, it's Dr. G. I want to welcome you to Engaging Minds. Hi, Dr. G. I'm happy to be here. Hey, Jane. So I want to tell you, I watched your documentary actually twice, the recent documentary, and I absolutely loved it. And, you know, we could spend a whole hour talking about it. But one of the things that struck me is near the end of the documentary, you said that you had recently been diagnosed with bipolar disease and that for the first time in your life, you stopped thinking about suicide on a daily basis. And I got to tell you, it, my heart just kind of fluttered for a second. I thought, I can't imagine what that experience was like. So I'm wondering if you could share it with our audience, because so many people out there are struggling with issues of mental illness. Yes, absolutely. Um, starting from about the time I was 11, I really started suffering from really hardcore depression. And uh, when I was 15, I had... Um, serious suicide attempt and um i was in the hospital for several days and after that um uh, i saw a psychiatrist for a little while and i don't think he was you know quite what i was looking for but on the other hand i feel like he kept me alive until i got through high school so that you know that was a big thing right mm -hmm. and then um i started out in the punk scene after high school and it was very exciting and you know, I think that kind of kept me going, but always inside me was this constant companion of every day, either sort of a passive thought of, oh, it would be okay if a bus hit me and I died to mm -hmm. maybe I should think about how I'm going to do it. Like seriously, every day. And wow. it became the norm for me. So I didn't really think about it that much. And um, as I got older, I realized that I think there is a connection between bipolar or depression and um, creativity, but I don't think, I'm gonna say this very clearly, I don't think you need to stay depressed to stay creative. I just think in your mind, maybe it's slightly entangled. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I agree with you 100%. And I think that that's, I'm so glad you brought that point up because, you know, I hear from artists all the time or artists that I work with, and there is such a fear of, you know, getting mentally healthy or letting go of drugs and alcohol as part of their routine because they're afraid that with that, they're going to lose their creativity. Uh -huh. and, you know, what I say to them is there's an illness and then there's a person. And we're going to treat the illness, but we're going to let the person go and let the person be creative. So you got to, if you can frame it in that term when people do it, uh -huh. They're a little less frightened. They understand that, you know what? I am who I am and my creativity is not dependent on my diagnosis. My yeah. creativity comes from my soul. It, it comes from who I am. And actually, once you start treating mental illness or something like bipolar disease, I bet you found that your you know, creativity actually expanded and not contracted. 
Right. I think maybe because I, I was spending less illness trying to manage my disease, you know, like I, it freed up my brain and my energy, I think. So I guess moving fast forward, I went in and out of therapy um, mm -hmm. again. I guess it kept me alive, but I still had this horrible thing inside me. And it wasn't until um, 2017 when I had another suicide attempt and um, my big sister, who is the boss of my family, sat me down and said, look, I'm, I'm not letting you do anything but concentrate on getting better. I am forbidding you not to do that. So went into therapy with both a therapist and a, um, a psychiatrist five days a week and just worked like hell. The psychiatrist really helped me with my meds because I had started, I finally got on antidepressants in um, 2000, um, it was like 20 years ago, I would say. And it helped, again, it helped me not do anything drastic, but I still didn't feel all the way better. But just really deciding to focus on my health, I finally, finally got there with the right meds and the right help, where, like you said, I don't have suicide thoughts anymore. And it's been three years now since that. And it's just, the weight off me is so immense and I feel this lightness that I have never had. You know, Jane, that is just so incredible to hear. And what I love about what you're saying too is that it's a process. And, um, you know, people need to understand that, that, you know, it may take a while to get your medication right. It may take a while for therapy to start sinking in, but having that support, having those people around you and just abandoning yourself that, I love what your sister said, you know, Jane, this is gonna take some time. What about if you give it focus? Then you can go back to your life and you're gonna have a different experience of your life than you did before. And that's exciting to hear and for our audience to know that. Cause you know, in the documentary, you talk about how you rose to fame literally overnight. Where's the Go-Go's? We got the beat. I couldn't walk down the street. That's how famous the Go-Go's were. People would freak out when we played. They just created something that exploded on the stage. We got the and that drugs and alcohol were a big part of it, especially in trying to manage the success. So if you look back on it now, what do you think was going on that made, you know, the success so difficult to handle in some respects? Well, we were very young. Um, exactly. I was only 20 when the band started and by, you know, within three years, we were number one. And so we didn't have the maturity level. We didn't have any coping skills or tools to deal with it. Um, we were girls and I think that added this whole nother level of weirdness and stress. And there were some addiction issues within the band and I think that I always say it's like, if, you know, this is a saying, I didn't make it up, but right. if your tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? So like you're trying to fix everything with drugs and alcohol. So you're exhausted, so you do some cocaine and then you're wound up, you drink, you know? And that was how we got through those years. and. It is lucky we were young in the sense that our bodies were able to handle it and none of us, you know, died. But <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's such a good point. You know, you get to be a certain age, let's say our age, and I say that to patients all the time too. Your body's just not going to be able to take it. Yeah. You're going to have to find different ways of coping. And you're right. You know, a lot of people deal with drugs and alcohol, especially at the beginning as a way of coping. They're looking... Mm -hmm you know, for a positive way of dealing with things. When I watched the documentary, I kept thinking, God, you know, I wish there were people around, like therapists around, consultants that could have just gone in there, but people weren't thinking about those things at that time. To be I able said. to give you, yeah, to be able to give you the support that mm -hmm. you really needed. And there, you know, that would have been 10th on my agenda of things that I need to get done today, you know, like, <laughs> it, <laughs> and for me, it was definitely self-medicating, definitely. So, you know, when I was in the manic phase, I would drink too much. When I was in the depressed pit, I would do, you know, cocaine and stuff too much. And um, self-medicating is a really bad idea, I have learned. <laughs> so I'm hoping, like now, as we have more awareness about mental health, that maybe the music industry will start to incorporate professionals into, you know, into their work with these amazing artists. That was amazing. 
Oh my God, do we have the beat? I love them. Coming up, Jane talks about the Go-Go's recent induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and her advice for someone just entering the music business. popular especially in the pop culture that they start struggling and really quickly they figure it out like they're mm -hmm. not waiting till they're in their 40s and 50s to deal with it they're <laughs> doing it all out young so i think the, the the problems are still occurring but they're just getting taken care of earlier which is amazing yeah it's amazing because the consciousness has risen and some of the stigma about mental health has seemed to dissipate uh, I know that you have, you're a nominee to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so congratulations. Yes! And here's my thoughts. So, if you were an all-male group, do you think that the nomination might have happened earlier? Um, I definitely think being all-female worked against us. I think there's still a ton of misogyny in the record business and in the entertainment business. and. The uh, people in that business hold women to a higher standard. I mean, we're not allowed to get old. Right. You know, so many things we're not allowed to do that men are allowed to do that it does make everything really tough. And part of the Rock Hall of Fame is the people that do the nominating, I mean, they're human and they have, you know, supposedly someone big on that committee had a real grudge against us. Um, <laughs> So when he left, all of a sudden it opened up to us. So there was that too. And you said earlier on, you know, it's very true because you were groundbreaking as far as women, rock and roll, an all-female band, the most successful all-female band in rock and roll history, let people mm -hmm. know that there was no one else doing what you were doing at that time on the level that you were doing it. So, you know, thank you for <laughs> creating those opportunities and uh, for a lot of women. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's one of the, I think, one of the things that we hold dearest is that we did inspire a lot of women to pick up an instrument, start songwriting, all that stuff. For someone who's coming into the business, let's say, starting up, and as a veteran as you are, what advice would you give them, especially around issues like mental health and keeping yourself together? I would say you've got to put yourself first. Um, so many girls are raised to be good girls where everyone else's needs come first and you know your job is to just shut up and act happy and pretty all the time and I think that is changing my generation that was definitely the norm so I think if you want to be in the entertainment business you better grow a tough skin really quickly and you better realize your value and your worth. And I think it's really important to know who you are because even if you have talent, if you don't know where you are, what you want, what your focus is and where you wanna go, it's impossible. You have to be so focused and so strong. I think that's amazing advice that you've given everyone. I, I You look fabulous. <laughs> And um, I want to tell you, we're around the same age. So I remember being at some go-go concerts. So I was a big fan many, many years ago. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And uh, listen, I, I, I want to wish you the best of luck. And uh, I'm hoping that, you know, now that there is good mental health, sobriety, et cetera, that there's a whole new exciting phase of your life uh, happening. Oh, thank you. I am actually really enjoying getting older. I never thought I'd say that, but it feels good. You know, I, I well, but I kind of feel the same way because you know what I feel like? I'm just going to say what I want to say at this point because I really don't care what other people think. Yes, yes, I don't care. And I've started learning how to say no to people and oh my God, the power of no when you've been, been a yes person all your life, the power of no is very big. Yes. Jane, thank you so much for coming on Engaging Minds. Thanks, Dr. G. Next, the power of storytelling, how it can transform our lives and our business. This portion of Dr. G Engaging Minds is brought to you by Darenot Health. 
Sobriety can oftentimes challenge us to recreate our lives. So I've asked Mark Twiddle and Lynn Ferguson of You Tell Yours to tell us how storytelling can not only help us transform our lives in addiction, but can also help us transform our lives in business. So story, right, here's the thing. Story and the way that we work uh, works on two principles. One is nobody ever can or ever will see the world exactly as you do. Therefore, the close, you're your own pot of gold really, but the closer you can get to understanding what's going on, uh, the clearer things are, right? Right. That, does that make sense? Yeah, you're looking for clarity. Yeah. A lot of problems within business, and in fact with communication, can be solved with this one thing. Let what's me tell that? you, called the doorway, okay. right? Um, and I'm going to tell you a story, unsurprisingly, about what the doorway is, which is at one point, when I was away, Mark uh, rented out this studio. This is my studio where I see people and everything. Mark, oh, your studio. it's my studio. <laughs> Belongs to me. Okay, you two, are we going to have to do couples counseling? <laughs> <laughs> and so I came into the studio, I was waiting for a client. Uh, I opened the trash can and somebody had left fruit in there and all these like tiny little flies flew out and they were like everywhere. And I'm like, oh my God, nobody ever appreciates my work. Look at me having to deal with everything. I have to deal with the fruit flies, I have to deal with the clients. Like I'm already full victim mode, right? right. I'm busy, I'm stressed, I'm jet lagged, I have flies in my studio. And then uh, the door, there was a knock on the door, and Arthur, who's there, mm -hmm. um, starts barking. So now I have fruit flies, the dog barking, right? And I'm angry because I'm like, the whole world is against me. I have a client to do, I have well, like things that I'm dealing with, and, and nobody gets it. And I open the door and I'm furious. And on the doorstep, there is a guy with flowers, someone delivering flowers. But the point of the doorway, is narratively where we often are. I am in my story, which is nobody understands me, I'm under pressure, I have so much to do, I'm on a deadline. And this guy at the door is delivering flowers, but he doesn't know what for, right? He doesn't know whether it's a birthday, he doesn't know whether someone's died, he doesn't know whether it's an apology or a thank you or a get well soon. He doesn't know, he just knows that he has this message to deliver. Often in business, we are the person in the doorway, right? We know that we're coming there with flowers. We know that they're probably good quality flowers, right? We bring something that is useful, but we walk into a situation and we have no idea what the company is dealing with. Right? And I think that's the most important thing that we've talked about in our work together. You know, as we started working in addiction and the three of us have worked with a lot of clients, we really honed that skill of listening. And I feel like business is, you know, that is really where the new, like when you talk about, you know, coming into this new world after COVID, yeah. that's what the new reality is. You're going to need people who are expert listeners to come in and hear what people are saying. Totally. There's an awful lot of business talk about focus specifically that I think is the opposite of listening. So there's this focus on your goals, like set your goals, set your targets, you know, drive, you know, you've got to drive and grip towards those grow goals. But if you're doing all that focusing, you're not doing an awful lot of listening. And while you're not listening, you're not noticing the opportunities that are around. The world is going to be different after the pandemic, but we don't know what's going to be different. So we need to listen. But you know what, it's so true, and, and it is about helping people create their vision. I've seen as a psychologist, whether I'm working in addiction or business, the people that have, can get in touch with their voice, the, the spirit of a company, those are the people that, when it feels true and it really resonates with them, those are usually the people that are most successful and actually have happier lives and less problems with addiction. Totally. Well, actually, addiction and bad business have a lot of similarities. Yes, they do. <laughs> and we're going to share. Yeah, it's all about punishment and self -hate. Like, I, I hate when people say, well, I have to do this. It's for business. Well, also, narratively, just working in terms of story, addiction is about the inability to look forward but being haunted by the past, right? Right. So that you can't particularly move on because you're still struggling with something that you haven't quite got past, right? A lot of addiction is based around that. And bad business 
is when you're unable to adapt to what the world has created, right? Like what, how our addiction skills or dealing with addiction will help business now is that you can help a business say it's okay to let go of how things used to be. Where do you wish to get to? Our hero in sobriety is Jason Williams, a former NBA All-Star who conquered tragedy and addiction with a passion for helping others. Hi, I'm Jason Williams, former NBA All-Star. Mike Chavisky, not an All-Star. <laughs> Hi, we're both passionate about rebound and sobriety. Let's go. Well, I'm passionate about sobriety. I'm passionate about helping people, but I'm more passionate about my routine. I go to bed at 8.30. Um, I wake up at 325, I have no alarm clock. Uh, passion wakes me up every morning. And the first thing I do when I get to our farm, which is a farm here, um, is I let the chickens out. And then we feed the chickens. And guess what the chickens eat? Dry worms. Guess what the fish eat? Cat food. Go figure. So we feed these guys up. They love to the scratch. So you want to throw them out over here. We got four hands. No roosters, and you might be asking, why no rooster? Because if you have rooster, then you get more chickens. I am so passionate about getting here every morning and sticking to my routine and knowing that somebody's depending on me. It might not just be my teammates or my staff, it's my animals. This is uh, Jordan. And that is Brady, Michael Jordan, Tom Brady. Get, get it? Greatest of all time, goats. So when people can depend on me now, now that I'm sober, I'm living straight and narrow, that gives me peace. I wish when I was playing basketball that I knew more about sobriety. Um, I didn't know what treatment was. I never knew treatment, you can go away somewhere. And maybe in my community, the African-American community, we're uneducated and unaware that you can go to treatment because most of the time when I went to treatment, there was only one or two people of color in there. So we have to take advantage of saying, hey, I need help and going to get it. So uh, those are one of the things I'm passionate about also is about educating people and releasing the stigma of this. And what we do here at Rebound that makes us different is that every Sunday after church, we go into the community and we feed the homeless, the less advantaged, I should say. Uh, we hang out there, we let people know, um, hey man, we're struggling too. Uh, maybe not in the same way, but we can help each other. These are some of the projects we've created here with the alumni. We're always trying to keep the property on the farm looking pretty good. Uh, we built these columns here. I'm a brick mason by trade. You know, me and my dad built our home. So we had to build our flowers and our herbs up high so that the goats can't get to them. And this is all built by the alumni and us, you know? So you see how far it goes down. There's over 600 feet of fence. And uh, we did it all ourselves and it kept us occupied, and we were productively busy, which is a different from just being busy. And the other thing I wanted to touch upon, and you know we do all these different outdoor adventure therapies, and that's to take you out your comfort zone. But we also eat out every day, so we go to restaurants. Um, we don't put you in a bubble for 30 days, and then when you walk out, the first thing you smell a beer at the airport and you relax. We come back here, and our life coaches process everything in our groups and our classes. So I'm just so proud just to be a part of it and through the grace of God, helping to save people's lives, including my own. I wanna thank Jane Weaven for coming on the show today. I hope what we discovered offers you and your loved ones hope, insight, and courage. Find out more about Dr. G Engaging Minds by visiting our website and social media.